What science is and how and why it works. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alexey Malov. I'm the coordinator of the team of translators in WebDider Studios. So today, we're interviewing our guest, professor of neuroscience in Stanford University, Mr. Robert Sapolsky. Hello. Hello, okay. Robert. Uh, he has written several books in, uh, on the topic of biology and behavior. And in 2017 and 2018, the publishing house Alpina Nonfiction is planning to publish three more books written by him in Russian language. So you, our dear viewers, you probably know him as an author of the course Human Behavioral Biology uh, that you can find on our channel in Russian language. And uh, I would like to say thank you to our su subscribers because the whole translation of the lectures was made possible uh, by you, by your support. And also today, most of the questions were submitted by our subscribers and we hope that Robert will answer them. And I think we can start. Is sure. it fine with you? Oh, okay, yeah. So one more time. Yes. Good morning, Robert. <laughs> Good morning. And our first question is uh, quite in the personal side. So as we know, you were born in a family of Soviet immigrants. So, has anyone tried to teach you Russian, and do you know any Russian words? Well, I'm not sure if I actually count as being the child of Soviet immigrants in that my father came over uh, as a boy in 1919. So, I don't know if it was quite Soviet yet at that point, uh, but it was certainly no longer czarist. Um, and my mother came over as a fetus <laughs> around 1918, um, they are of, they were of the generation of Russian emigres uh, who basically got to the United States and never wanted to speak a word of Russian again. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was never a question of coming back to visit. Um, so there was very little Russian growing up. About the only thing I ever learned uh, when I was in high school, I was playing piano for a ballet school, um, and I was actually quite terrible. Um, and the teacher was Russian, and she was very stern and was not approving of my playing at all. And I was fairly sure I was about to be fired. Um, so my father taught me on this one particular day to come in and this has been many, many decades since saying this, so I have no idea if this will even sound correct. But I came in that morning and I said, Здравствуйте, madame, как вы поживаете сегодня? Очень хорошо. That's good. That's good. She was delighted and she didn't bother me anymore and I kept my job. But I think that's basically been my only Russian since then. But still not bad. Very useful phrase, actually. Yep. It helped, but that, that's it for Russian. I wish I knew it. Well, I hope you'll have a chance, maybe. We'll teach you something. Okay, next question, going closer to your science. Uh, so, what, what brought you into biology and at what age did you, decide, did you decide that you actually want to become a scientist? Well, I was one of those people who figures out what he wants to do at an extremely early age. I was actually about eight years old when I decided I wanted to uh, study primate behavior out somewhere in the field in Africa, um, which I know is a fairly young age, but I was quite set on that. By the time I was about 12 years old, I was... I was writing letters to famous primatologists telling them how wonderful I thought they were. I was, by high school, I was studying Swahili because I knew I would be going to work in Africa someday in East Africa. So I, I focused pretty early on. It was not until college that I also became interested in neuroscience and moved in the direction of doing both laboratory work, neuroscience, 
and fieldwork primatology. But I was one of those at a very, very early age. I knew what I wanted to do. Just a little side question. And how exactly at the age of eight did you realize that you want to study primates? Um, well, it's one of those when you when you meet people who do field research. And as part of my work, I've spent for about 30 years now, I've been going back and forth mm -hmm. between my laboratory work and studies of wild primates, baboons in a national park in East Africa. Um, so when you meet people who do field work, generally, maybe about three quarters of them come from families where they grew up having some experience with that. Their parents were missionaries, their parents were researchers, whatever. Um, so they were accustomed to that. Uh, the remainder I find grew up in some just God awful, terrible urban area in the middle of something like that, in my case, in a not very nice neighborhood in New York City. And at some point you study, you you discover the Natural History Museum and mm. you suddenly realize, oh, my God, <laughs> there is like another world out there. Um, and that was my case. The the American Museum of Natural History in New York City um, I basically like lived in there whenever possible. And something about the primate section of it just caught something in me. So it was at that age that I decided I was going to go do field work someday. That is, that's awesome. <laughs> that's cool. Um, another kind of private question. Uh, is your family religious? And was there any conflict between religion and your scientific curiosity? Um, there's no conflict at all, simply because I have absolutely no religious beliefs. Um, <laughs> I was brought up very, very strictly religious orthodox. Um, and when I was 13, magically, suddenly, none of it stopped making any sense to me whatsoever. And I have not thought about uh, any religious beliefs since then. Um, my wife and I and our kids, none of us are religious. We are all atheists. We are, <laughs> we are proud of it. Um, it's a strange minority to be in in the United States. Yeah. Um, so I personally do not see how you can be both a scientist and religious, even though uh, obviously, there's many, many scientists who are. Um, personally, for me, it's simply not possible. So it was like 13 years old, it just like something snapped? Um, I actually woke up in the middle of the night um, and I sort of had this realization. It, it all sort of came all at once. Um, there's no God, <laughs> there's no purpose, and there's no free will. Um, no doubt it had something to do with hormones and puberty, but that's, <laughs> that's the form that it took. And it's been gone ever since. Um, and a lot of the teaching and writing that I do, I think, is explicitly challenging notions of free will. Mm -hmm. uh, in between the lines it is challenging the notion that um, it is possible to have a universe with very structured rules and patterns and organization and not to have to invoke something or someone who designed it all. Um, what mathematicians might call emergent properties of mm -hmm. these systems. Um, so I, I, I do a little bit of propagandizing along those lines, but basically whatever was going on that night in my brain um, since 13, it's been gone. I have not been capable of anything like that since then. Interesting. Thanks. So okay, the next question was, is there a God? So obviously you already answered that. <laughs> um, and what are neurobiological reasons for being religious? And could it be that being a religion is a necessary step in development of a, any civilization? And uh, yeah, and you already covered the question of religious scientists. So yeah, what's the neurobiology of being religious? And if, it, uh, in your opinion, it is necessary for a civilization? Um, I sure don't think it's necessary at all. Um, I think in that regard, sort of something I always emphasize is how Scandinavian countries 
over the last century have invented the most complete system of social support for its citizens, uh, the best healthcare system, the highest level of happiness, the most tolerance, the least violence, have invented societies that have all of the pro-social behavior one would want to see, while at the same time over the last century the rate of religiosity in those mm -hmm. countries has gone from quite high to virtually zero. So you, you don't need to get all the benefits of civilization uh, in order. Uh, you, it does not require religiosity. In terms of why, nevertheless, every culture yes. that has ever been studied has some form of religious belief. And within most cultures, there's a high percentage of believers. In the United States, it's something like 95% mm -hmm. of people who say... Well, it's about 5% of people who say that they are certain that they are atheists. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very high percentage in terms of why that is the case. Um, humans like explanations. Humans like causality. Mm -hmm. Humans like simple chains of causality. Um, humans especially like that during periods of stress, during periods of anxiety. Um, a sense of control, a sense of predictability, a sense of explanation is very psychologically protective against stress. And um, I don't know if there's there, there's a, an idiom, an expression in English um, called there's no atheists in foxholes, yeah. um, where it's not surprising that towards the end of people's lives, during periods of crises, during periods of stress, people become more religious at those times. Um, it's very good having an explanation. And in a sense, in terms of what is psychologically stressful about the unknown, um, there's kind of a hierarchy of explanation. In the face of the miserable, frightening, terrifying, mysterious things that like, are inevitable in life, um, it's very helpful to think there is an explanation for why it happened. It's even better if you feel that the explanation has some sort of benevolent architect mm -hmm. functioning somewhere behind it. It's even better if you think that benevolent architect listens to people when they are making requests of him. It's even better if that benevolent architect listens more to you and people who look like you and sound like you and pray like you. It's a hierarchy of control and predictability um mm. and when it's done right it's very stress reducing mm. um one of the other interesting things in terms of not just religious belief um but the type of religious belief has been really interesting work done uh looking cross-culturally at traditional societies across the planet um and what people have noted is if you look at hunter-gatherer societies mm -hmm. Um, and you look at the sort of religions they have, um, they do not have gods that would be called moralizing gods. Um, their gods do not pay attention to humans. They're not interested in humans. They don't judge humans. They don't give out punishment to humans. You only find the invention of moralizing gods when you have societies that are large enough that they start having anonymous interactions with people. As soon as cultures get large enough that you start having large towns, things of that sort, as soon as there's the possibility that you're interacting with strangers who you're never going to see again and who you could be rotten to anonymously, that's right around the time that humans start inventing gods that care about... So, like, somehow to, about. to control these interactions with a person that you actually don't care about. Exactly. That's where the pro-sociality begins to come in. And there's even been studies cross-culturally, the more people of a culture believe in a hell, mm -hmm. the more pro-social behavior there tends to be. The more there's belief in a forgiving heaven, the less there is. It's, you know, it's inventing a police force. Yeah. Um, and if you live in a small hunter-gatherer band where everybody is at least a third cousin and you've all been in the same place for your whole lives, you really don't need to invent a god who's interested in what you're doing. Your gods just care about like feasting and 
who's getting to sleep with who kind of thing, who among the gods are getting to do that, not, not among the humans. So it's a very distinctive feature to the type of religion that one comes up with. That's interesting. And I, I believe you have a special like whole le lecture or even in your course, there is a lecture on re re uh, religiosity. And so probably we'll get even more details in that. Uh, okay, continuing the topic of like cultural things and their biological reasons, uh, two, like two questions in one. Uh, first is, what is human ego in terms of biology? And does it have any like, or neurobiology, does it have any evolutionary reasoning why we have this thing that we call ego? Um, well, that along with the, a word that just terrifies me to use in the context of science because it makes me feel so overwhelmed, that along with consciousness, <laughs> religiosity, art, aesthetics, all of those, the endless debate is, are those things that have actively evolved? Mm -hmm. Is there an adaptive reason? Is there adaptive reason that like almost every culture has come up with something resembling music and something resembling dance? Is there adaptive reason for any of this? Or is it baggage? Is it evolutionary baggage? If you're going to have a brain with as many neurons as we have and with as many connections, one of the emergent properties of it is going to be consciousness and aesthetics and a sense of self-awareness. Um, you now see primitive senses of self-awareness in lots of other species, but the human version is very, very advanced, obviously. So the big debate is, does that just sort of happen if you have complex enough of a system there, enough pieces that are interacting with each other? Um, the scientist uh, writer Steven Pinker um, has once sort of very sarcastically described it as, so is art and consciousness and all of that, is that just frosting on top of the cake? Mm. Is that unessential? Does that just sort of come along with things? Um, or is it adapted for? Um, and I sure don't know the answer, but I am very impressed with some of the things that complex emergent systems accomplish um, in terms of producing things that may have absolutely nothing to do with adaptiveness. Um, interestingly, this question of do you get consciousness with enough elements of a system in there with enough neurons or enough silicon chips, this yeah. question is very, very pertinent these days in terms of computer science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. And like, on what side are you standing more or less? Like, what, what side would you pick? Is it like evolutionary? thing or it's just accident or it's just frosting um i think it's probably an accident simply because amid consciousness and this very extreme human capacity for long-term planning mm -hmm. perceiving the future imagining one things of that sort lots of adaptive advantages to that you can store food away because yeah. you know the dry season comes eventually all of that sort of thing on the other hand that's the building block of anxiety anxiety mm -hmm. and depression and things of that sort um and those are not terribly adaptive so i think it's a mixed bag I think that's what very, very complex systems wind up producing, um, which is mighty interesting in terms of implications for computer consciousness. And uh, actually, yeah, going further on the, those things that like humans have, but we actually suffer because of them, because we have it. Uh, the question about suffering and fear of death. Do any other animals besides humans know what is suffering and what is death and are they afraid of do they have the fear of death when there is no particular threat can they somehow imagine maybe like and predict without being actually without their lives uh, being threatened can they feel the fear of death my sense is there's no evidence for that at all um there's decent evidence with non-human primates, particularly apes. Um, surprisingly, with corvid birds, 
uh, like crows and jays that are extremely intelligent. They've got some capacity for long-term planning. They can hide food away for future use, mm -hmm. um, things of that sort. Okay, so they can have some conception of the future in terms of planning and such. There's absolutely no reason to think that that extends to any of the big existential things that we deal with when thinking about the future. Um, you look at, okay, you could look at a low-ranking baboon, mm -hmm. and he's sitting there minding his own business, and a terrifying high-ranking guy shows up and walks past him. They don't interact. There's no threat. There's no anything. He's just sitting there watching this high-ranking guy walk past. And what studies have shown is if you do what's called ambulatory cardiology, there's a heart rate monitor on the baboon. You show he's sitting there perfectly quietly, no interaction with this horrible, scary, aggressive guy. But the guy shows up and walks past him and his blood pressure goes through the roof. Awesome. He's terrified. So he's he terrified. The question is, what is he terrified of? Is he terrified of... Like, this guy could kill me? Is he terrified of mortality? Is he terrified <laughs> of psychological humiliation? Is he, or is he just, oh my God, don't hurt me. Don't even notice that I'm here. I think it's much more the latter. There's no reason to think from any scientific standards that anything more resembling a future-oriented sense of fear exists. Hmm. But... I mean, we people, we do have understanding of like life and death and we have the fear of death. So in terms of that slightly provocative question about what's your position on euthanasia, of, like voluntarily committing suicide? Yeah, um, I, I don't know the <laughs> climate at your end of the world uh, where I'm in. California is a politically very progressive part of the United States. The particular area I live in is probably the most so of anywhere in the United States. So where I am, it's not a, it's not a controversial issue at all. It is simply a given. Um, people should have that right. People who are terminally ill, mm -hmm. uh, people who have gone through sufficient psychological and psychiatric testing to make sure that this is not an acute depression, but rather is a decision reached in a relatively mentally healthy state of mind. It's just a given at this point that that should be allowed. Uh, nonetheless, that is a very, very minority opinion in the United States. And it's only the more progressive areas that are enacting any sort of laws allowing that. But I mean, still US, how, how many, do you know how many states allow euthanasia out of um, 50? I don't. My guess would be it could not possibly be more than four or five. Ah, so just uh, the most progressive ones, right? Exactly. One of them is right next door to California, a state called Oregon, which is fairly small and obscure and uh, overall as a state is fairly left-leaning, fairly mm -hmm. progressive. They, a number of years ago, passed a right to die law with that and physician assisted suicide and like everybody in this end of the country sort of thinks that well if anything awful ever happened you would just go to oregon um but it's very few um i think probably as most of your subscribers would have some sense of the united states is not only a very very religious country but it's of a particularly uh unprogressive type um, it's definitely a minority view on my part. Going to one of the interviews that you've given already, you were speaking about criminal justice and free will. And I think you said that in theory you can predict antisocial behavior based on the brain structure or like based on genetics. And what are the technical issues now which don't allow, or are there some principal problems that you can never tell by scanning the brain that, okay, this guy is going to be like a criminal and this guy won't be. Or it's just technical issues and we'll have um, it in the future. I think it depends on how, uh, 
how assertively you define technical issues as being. Um, but first, I mean, is the, it the, the level the level of technology on, on how, how much we can how detailed we can see the structure and the functioning of the brain now. Yeah, um, at this point, absolutely zero predictive power um, in that regard. And first, as a as a clarification, I would not say that knowledge about, for example, genetics will ever give us that power. Uh, genetics tells us next to nothing outside mm -hmm. the context of environment. Um, I would not say that brain structure of the type that you can study with brain imaging techniques will have much predictive power unless it's coupled with insights about brain function. Um, I think basically in theory, if you knew about somebody's genetic makeup mm -hmm. and the fetal environment in which epigenetic effects occurred in their brain and their childhood experiences and what culture they were raised in and what their endocrine levels are like and what their brain, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to like what color underwear they put on that morning, maybe eventually there will be some predictive power with it. At this stage, if you looked at the brain of someone and saw that there was extensive damage, for example, to its frontal cortex, mm -hmm. you probably have about 90% accuracy at predicting that they would be doing socially inappropriate things if you spent more than 10 minutes talking to them. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, uh, there is no power to predict whether that socially inappropriate behavior is going to be that they they are a serial murderer or if they speak too loudly or stick their face too close to yours when they're talking or if they like make too loud of noises with their mouths when they eat you know what the range of what counts as socially inappropriate behavior because a regulatory part of the brain has been damaged is enormous simply by knowing there's damage there that's not going to tell you who is going to be the antisocial criminal and who is going to like burp loudly at the dinner mm. table when that's considered sort of rude and, and poor taste you need to know a million other things about that person and in terms of you said about the frontal cortex and like being able to control basically to control your behavior to control yourself uh, another question that comes up very often is about uh, humans and instinct. Does the concept of instinct actually apply to humans and to what extent instinct, whatever is meant by that, uh, influences and controls the behavior or people can like suppress it? Um. Let's see, the word instinct got sort of a dirty reputation among American scientists um, about 50 years ago, just because it was viewed as it explains everything and it explains nothing. An instinct is, you know, somebody hits your knee and your leg kicks out. That's instinct. Instinct, uh, the majority of humans wind up having some instances of aggressive behavior. Instinct, instinct for being entrepreneurial, instinct for being a capitalist, instinct, it, it just, scientists got embarrassed using that word after a while because it meant so little. Um, what I think is a much better way of describing it is whether humans have certain uh, tendencies, proclivities, potentials, vulnerabilities uh, that more readily happen than others. Perfect example of this. Um, a classic view would be that humans, for example, instinctually are afraid of snakes and spiders. Humans have an instinctual phobia for that. Um, and that certainly seems to be the case until you look at people who have snakes as pets and give them baby names and love them and like have birthday parties for them. Or you see with kids who grow up in New Guinea chasing after spiders for fun and then cooking them up and they're the most delicious things. And what you see in actuality is it's not that humans instinctually are afraid of, say, spiders or instinctually dislike them. It takes less negative conditioning for somebody to develop a fear of spiders 
than to develop a fear of like panda bears. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a predisposition for that. It takes less conditioning to make somebody afraid of heights or afraid of being submerged in water than it takes to condition them to be afraid of sitting and looking at a video game or some such thing. So with an awful lot of what used to be mistaken for inevitabilities, mm -hmm. one way of describing that perhaps could be instinctual. Um, instead, we just have some strong tendencies, but they are not universal. And there's always dramatic exceptions. And it's about a lot of the biology of behavior is just about tendencies and vulnerabilities and potentials that overwhelmingly, for example, is what the genetics of behavior is all about. But uh, all the, well, that you described, I mean, the spiders, the snakes, the heights, the water, that's all basically what you would call, I think, uh, self-preservation instinct. So, I mean, the details can vary, yes, but the whole idea of self-preservation, of, uh, uh, I don't know, living as many copies of your genes as possible, so basically procreating and having like sex with as many uh, partners as possible. Isn't th can these tendencies be called an instinct in terms of human behavior? Um, I think in that regard, for the most part, yes. Um, for the most part, in terms of obviously evolution having strongly selected for that for the most part yet yes um until you see people who give up their lives for strangers until you see people who uh choose to be celibate and it's not that they are helping their close siblings pass on more copies of their genes they join some religious group where you don't reproduce um, until you see people who give away all of their life savings to strangers on the other side of the planet. Uh, Bill Gates being a wonderful example of that in many ways. Um, so in a broad sense, yep, humans fit that pattern. And when you look closely, what of course is always the most interesting is the dramatic exceptions to it. And is, so that's basically maybe like the role of consciousness overwriting that? Probably. Consciousness, individual differences, idiosyncrasies. I mean, if you look at baboons long enough, as I have, uh -huh. you realize very few of them have read textbooks on evolutionary biology and sort of optimization of behavior and passing on copies of genes. They make mistakes. They have strange personalities. This one always does this ridiculous, stupid thing that you know is going to cause him to wind up losing a fight. This one, like if a non-human primate can have that strong of idiosyncratic personality differences, humans obviously do. I mean, just looking at the range of cultural values we have invented, looking at the range of religions, looking at the range mm -hmm. of moral systems of what's okay, what's terrible, what's what will get you into paradise after life. That you know, it's very, very varied. But yes, it is within a broad backdrop of evolutionary pressure for passing on copies of genes. And actually, you've, you've spoken about baboons, and oh, uh, pretty often people uh, uh, and scientists, they uh, like observe some behavior in some species, and then you transfer your observations, like what you understood, to other species. For example, you look at baboons and you kind of make, uh, make up your mind on some questions about how humans behave, so how safe is it to do that? I mean, to, uh, to make conclusions uh, observing one species and then apply those conclusions to another species? Um, it's very, very limited. And there's a terrible temptation to decide that because you just spent, spent the last 80 years studying this one species of ant and like you dream about them every night and you understand what every, that this explains everything or this one species of whatever. Um, what you need to do is understand the variability across related species mm -hmm. uh, that are close to humans. 
to understand the ways in which one particular species is a good model for us. Baboons are a wonderful model for psychological stress in humans, um, which is why I study them out in the field. Um, they live in these ecosystems, savannas that are extremely great environments, um, so that baboons only have to work about three hours every day to get their food. They live in these big organized troops, so predators do not bother them much. And what happens is if you're a primate and you have nine hours of free time every day and you're not worrying about predators, you have most of each day to devote to being absolutely miserable to each other, generating competition and hierarchy and social stress. They're wonderful models for studying westernized humans. <laughs> On the other hand, they're terrible models for studying pair bonding behavior in humans because baboons are among the most polygamous primates that are out there. They're terrible models for that. I think where you get your most insight is seeing where humans fit with respect to a variety of other species. And in that regard, um, I grew up in the scientific era where one of the sound bites was uh, that humans share 98% of their DNA yeah. with chimps. And chimps, oh my God, chimps, they kill each other. They're extremely aggressive. They're hierarchical. They have something resembling the starts of organized violence. They're and then along came bonobos mm -hmm. and people appreciating what a totally different social system bonobos have. And it was about 15 years ago that people figured out that we share 98% of our DNA with bonobos as well. And so there's slightly about... Slightly different 98%? Like. Yep. It's about a 1.5% shared differences between chimps and bonobos, but it's about the half percent that makes for a totally different world of, like, if you have a choice in the matter, you would probably much rather be a bonobo than a chimp in terms of having, mm. like, a pleasant life. Um, we're not bonobos. We're not chimps. We're somewhere in between. And in most regards, we wind up being in between with a lot of traits, which wind up making us a very interesting species and a very confused one, <laughs> one that generates a lot of variability. Um, so obviously, I, I've spent my life studying baboons in one setting and studying laboratory rats in another. Um, I obviously think there's a lot that that tells you about humans, um, but you have to pick your, your domains carefully and by the way speaking about peculiarities of humankind and like being in between uh, of course like one of the main questions that comes out of like your, the first lectures of your course is about the tournament species and pair bonding species so as, uh, probably baboons would be example of a tournament species classic classic tournament and uh, another monkey bonobos that's pair bonding Bonobos are interesting. They're another one of those exceptions to it. Um, they are, they look like a pair bonding species in terms of a lot of their physical traits, um, in terms of their low levels of aggression, um, in terms of their female dominance. But rather than having a monogamous pair bonding sexual system, they're highly, highly polygamous. Um, but it's not built around competition. Bonobos are at least as weird as humans are evolutionarily, but a classic example of a pair bonding primate species might be gibbons, mm. these Southeast Asian apes. They pair bond for life. So yeah, you're right. Baboons are classic tournament species. Gibbons are you know, classic pair bonding ones. And there's humans who yes. are halfway in between, halfway by genetic measures, halfway by anatomical measures, halfway by hormonal aspects of how we work, halfway in between in every regard. And what does that explain? That explains the fact why the majority of human cultures throughout history have been polygamous, how nevertheless, within the majority of polygamous cultures, the majority of individuals have been in pair bonded marriages. Mm. How nevertheless, a large percentage of people in pair bonded marriages cheat on their marriages or the marriages don't last. And how nevertheless, the majority of Earth's religions and cultures have come up with myths and stories about how that's a bad thing to do. We're like 
totally confused. And whether you are a, a poet or a divorce lawyer, <laughs> um, you understand the extent to which humans are somewhere halfway in between and different individuals differ as to just how halfway they are. And it creates a great deal of complexity and interest and excitement and misery and sadness and heartache. And we're a very confused species because it's in that domain probably more than any that we're exactly in between all the standard evolutionary models. And actually, it seems like that's exactly the things that they usually say that that what makes a human a human. I mean, all, all that misery, suffering and like all the poetry and art. But speaking about us being in between, is there any chance or what should happen in order for humankind to split into two different species? Maybe when one will be pair bonding and another will be tournament or maybe one of these types of behavior just completely dying out, being dominated by another one. Is there any indications that humanity will end up tournament or pair boarding or will split into two? Well, I think that's very unlikely. It's certainly going to make movies and television much less interesting. <laughs> that does eventually happen. Um, a sort of like unexciting scientific version of explaining why that's the case is because traits like that um, show the evolutionary property of what's called balanced equilibrium. Mm -hmm. um, in a world in which everybody is tending towards a particular trait, having this now rarer trait suddenly becomes more valuable and that mm -hmm. now shifts in the other direction and you know you you oscillate around a an average there. And that's probably a trait in humans that shows frequency dependent balanced selection. Much more interestingly is that people with very strong uh, proclivities in one of those directions, nonetheless, fall in love with people with very strong proclivities in the other direction. And all of their friends sit there and say, Oh, my God, what are they thinking? This is never going to work. And maybe a lot of the time it doesn't work. Um, but Copies of genes have been passed on along the way before it all falls apart. Wow. Yeah, I don't think we're about to split them that way anytime soon. Yeah, as, as soon as you get your genes going on, I mean, it doesn't matter what happens with you, basically. Yeah, I think the one domain where that might happen is in the last sort of recent months or so, it may be possible that things in the United States are eventually could have produced two different species of people who voted for Trump and people <laughs> who did not. There's already reports of some marriages falling apart because of that. Um, and this may eventually split us into two different species and we'll have to see what happens from there. But along pair bonding versus polygamous mm -hmm. lines, I don't think it's going to happen in that domain. Um, so, okay, again, speaking about human behavior and genetics and so on, uh, how can you study such a complex thing, all of that in-betweens and peculiarities as human behavior, without getting into reductionism? Because that's one of the big problems when going into biology, how, how not to get too far in, re like, in reductionism, yes. How we can avoid um, One would hope the biggest reason why people will not try to explain those most interesting domains of humans and human behavior and human individuality, try to explain it with strict reductionism, is because strict reductionism doesn't work and doesn't explain a whole lot. Um, nevertheless, um, the usual response of most scientists that I've seen is when a reductive approach turns out not to have much predictive power, the explanation is obvious. The answer is obvious. Ooh, we're not reductive enough yet. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get even more reductive. And that's, that's the dominant model here. Um, if you cannot clone something, if you cannot get a DNA sequence, if you not, cannot get something down to the molecular level, um, you're obviously going to like never be able to understand anything. And reductionism, like genetic reductionism, may give a fairly good explanation on a very reductive level for why certain 
congenital neurological diseases involve changes in behavior. It's never going to explain why the person sitting next to you um, is in the subtle ways that make life most interesting is a different person than you are. Knowing what is occurring in every single synapse in someone's brain, that level of reductionism is never going to explain much. There's all these non-additive, non-linear, chaotic properties to complex systems, and we are a complex system. Um, but the trouble is, you know, ever since people discovered that science gives you more explanatory models than like throwing like goat intestines on the ground and deciding that can tell you what the gods are thinking, you know, five, 600 years of Western scientific enlightenment thinking, um, the dominant model has been reduction. Reductionism is explaining everything. It explains very narrow things. Some of those narrow things are very important. Those narrow things allow us to invent vaccines, for example. Um, nevertheless, it's not going to explain the most interesting aspects of behavior. That is not to say that non-reductive science is in some way any less scientific. Um, it's a very different type of science, though. But, but can you give an example of non-reductive sciences which are scientific? Okay. Um, the fact that, well... Once again, um, vaccines, vaccines, um, you start a vaccine campaign, you come up with a vaccine for a particular disease. And what you find is there's these paradoxical things that happen that as you start to vaccinate a population, you will often get a wave of increased rates of the disease for a short time afterward. And there's some sort of population biology dynamic that explains that involving math that I've never understood. Or frontal cortex. You damage 80% of the neurons in somebody's frontal cortex, mm. and they are now at an increased risk of being a murderer. Um, but they're also at an increased risk now of being somebody who, during the wedding ceremony, um, farts loudly and realizes doesn't like that's it. That's the way in which they are an outlaw violating the rules of society. Okay, so let's get some more reductive information on them. So they have this much frontal damage, and what were their testosterone levels like that morning? Now you've got like 80.1% predictability. Okay, well, let's throw in, did they grow up in a culture that believed in physical punishment of children or not? Okay, 81.13% predictability. Let's add on more factors, more factors. And what you eventually realize is when you add on those factors, they are not working in a linear additive manner. There's all sorts of synergistic effects that go on there reductionism you know if you want to figure out this is this is the metaphor that i always use if you want to figure out why a clock like an old tr traditional classic clock why the clock is no longer working it's very good to use science it's much better to do that than to like sacrifice a sheep to the gods and hope that the clock god will make the clock tick better what you do is you have a reductive problem you take the clock apart and you break it down to its component parts and you find the one little piece there that has something rather broken and you fix it and you add the pieces back together and you got a clock that works um if you want to understand why say a cloud does not rain why there's a drought you don't answer that by dividing the cloud in half and studying half of the cloud and then study there. But, oh, you haven't solved it yet. So let's divide each half of a cloud in half again and again and again. And eventually you're going to understand the cloud down on the most reductive level and put all the pieces back together again. And you have cured the cloud of not raininess. Um, it's not a reductive explanation for that. Humans are much more, when they have problems, are much more like clouds that don't rain than they are like watches that don't keep time right. Um, we're not reductive in a simple sense. But just like hypothetically, do you think it's possible in some future somehow actually have a possibility of like 99.9 .9 accuracy in predicting human behavior? 
by studying some of these reductive different facts. I mean, like, hypothetically, or down to atomic level, I don't know. In theory, you could get to 99% knowledge or 99.9% .9 or 99, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that probably still won't do you much good. And the reason for this is psychologically, it's a similar case to we could eventually cure 99% of the causes of death among humans. Mm -hmm or even 99.9, .9, or 99.9 .9 and 99, et cetera, et cetera. And unless we get to the point that we are fundamentally a different type of like living system than anything science understands at this point, fundamentally, no matter how many diseases you cure, there still is always going to be a leading cause of death that is still going to terrify us and still keep us awake at night and still break our hearts when a loved one succumbs to it. And in the same way, even if we could explain 99.9% .9 of human behavior in a reductive way, mm -hmm. there will still be surprises, surprises that make us delighted at the unexpected things that humans can produce in terms of amazing art or amazing personalities or whatever. There still will be surprises in terms of unexpected damaging behaviors that constitute the scariest things we have to live with and can society solve these problems what i suspect we'll do is we expand our realms of anxiety and happiness and excitement and anticipation and capacity for being surprised and all of that uh, to fill in whatever space of of lack of knowledge there is at that point reductionism is never going to explain everything and we are always going to still be most surprised by the things that are unexpected but just to make it clear for others it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to get to know as much as possible oh absolutely <laughs> um you know i do reductive stuff in my lab we we stick genes into brains of rats and try to change their behavior and for what we do um that's perfectly fine. We, we're, we're medieval peasants in terms of what we're <laughs> capable of doing, um, which is to say, like some of what my lab is focused on is can we do gene therapy, alter sort of the genome in rats and neurons in their brains so that they're more resistant to anxiety or depression and they're more resistant to stress. And yay, we can do that. We've discovered some genes that do that. And aren't we amazing? And we can show that. And it works. It works in like 51% of the rats. <laughs> uh, and you do your statistics and then you figure out, okay, so here's what's going Okay, so you do this and you do. And now we're up to 57% predictability. And, you know, for us, we're, we're primitive. We're Neanderthals in what we're trying to do with our science. If we could come up with something that takes care of 75 percent of anxiety disorders that's great you keep trying you come up with a vaccine that's 93 percent effective that's much better than zero percent effective mm -hmm. polio wonderful all mm -hmm. of that despite the fact that i'm in a one in a hundred thousand cases of polio vaccinations instead produce a case of polio yeah if you're practical and you want to fix stuff reductive science is absolutely wonderful and more power to them and more power to me and people in my lab doing it nonetheless philosophically that's not the way you're going to explain everything because you're never going to be able to explain everything hmm. and just a quick opinion question about again like this reduction thing uh famously richard dawkins selfish gene concept uh, i think that can be called somehow reductionism i mean when you take it all, put it down to one gene, just like trying to make copies of itself. Just very briefly, your opinion on the whole uh, approach to the problem. Um, Richard Dawkins is an amazing scientist um, and an amazing communicator. Most evolutionary biologists these days, I think, subscribe to what would instead be called multi-level selection. In some cases, selection is at the level of single genes. In fact, in some cases, selection is at the level of little stretches of DNA that do not even constitute 
complete genes, but instead are these viral retrotransposons that make copies of themselves for their own sake with no function whatsoever. So selection could be on the level of stretches of DNA, DNA comprising an entire gene. Selection could be on the level of the entire genome. So rather than selfish genes, selfish genomes. But increasingly, people appreciate that selection also occurs on the level of groups in some circumstances. An old discredited version of this called group selection Mm -hmm. that was sort of thrown in the toilet in the mid-1960s, contemporary group selection thinking is not that way at all. It's most easily summarized in that there's circumstances where an individual A will leave more copies of genes than individual B because of some trait. Mm -hmm. But there are circumstances where groups of individual Bs functioning together will leave more copies of their genes than groups of individual A's. On that level, group selection is a contemporary issue in evolutionary biology. And in some circumstances, that works. It's very rare It only works in species that tend to divide themselves along moderately related traits, all of that. Humans, humans are the most subject to contemporary group selection effects. So some of the time, absolutely it's selfish genes, some of the time genomes, some of the time stretches and non-coding DNA, some of the time it's at a group level. Uh, What's most interesting in that field these days is people trying to figure out under what circumstances, which type of selection is more Mm. dominant. So it's like, I mean, I think it was in your very first introductory lecture, like skipping from bucket to bucket, never getting too, how to say, too, not, not to get too comfortable in one bucket because you don't, otherwise you won't want to leave it and you'll make mistakes. Exactly. Speaking about like changing parad- like different approaches and other stuff, in one of your lectures, I think it was first or second lecture, you were speaking about menstrual cycle synchronization and you said something about pheromones and this beautiful example about like hamsters, uh, that where the dominant hamster like synchronizes a uh, su- uh, subordinate hamster and that the same thing applies to humans. And there was this example, but I th- uh, later on there was uh, lots of critique to that approach and to those studies that humans don't even have pheromones and so on and so on. So can you actually finally clarify that because there was a huge discussion in the comment section under that lecture? That's so exciting to think about that happening. Um, Humans definitely have pheromones. (coughs) They have the neural pathways that process them and that tends to be a somewhat different olfactory processing system than the traditional one, something called the vomeral nasal system, which the dogma always was that the human system is completely atrophied out of existence. Still there, it works a bit. Um, But in terms of the specific of menstrual synchrony, the first report of that in humans was in the early 1970s. um, And it's been very controversial since then. Um, Some reports, some studies replicate the finding, others don't. Um, I don't know that field well, but my sense is the explanation for that is something that is just so classically a human sort of thing. Um, For every social species out there, um, social being closely socially, socially affiliated with another individual always translates into being close physical proximity to them. Two baboons who are closely affiliated, and I use a word here that's perfectly scientific, that are two friends, Mm -hmm. spend a lot of time each day in close contact. It's not until you get westernized humans that you could have something resembling a best friend on the other side of the planet, or even a best friend who you see at work each day, as opposed to your roommate in your college dormitory room, or the person you're like renting a flat with or whatever. And it turns out that there's some confusion as to whether the synchrony is more about physical proximity, roommates, for example, or if it's more about social proximity, best friends who spend a lot of their time socially together. 
I think that's where a lot of the confusion has come. And I think some of the sort of more subtle work in that area these days is trying to piece apart physical proximity uh, from social proximity. I think by the time you get to humans, uh, social proximity is a stronger element in the earth than people originally appreciated. But is it like that two humans are socially, like a friend, they are friends and socially close, uh, but like far away physically, and that what makes their physical trait ali traits alike? Or is it vice versa that maybe they were always physically similar, that's why they have become friends? Yep, all of the above, absolutely, and each reinforces the other. Um, I don't think there's any suggestion that, say, for example, you would get menstrual synchrony with your best friend who you've never met, who like you met online instead yeah. and who's in like Swaziland or something. <laughs> um, no, there, there, there seems to be a need for a certain amount of physical proximity. Um, but and you're absolutely right that similar traits select for friends mm -hmm. select for mating partners that reinforces similarity even further in lots of cases yeah they reinforce each other hey once again we're a complicated species <laughs> so um uh, and then probably one of the last questions then um latest discovery or discoveries in biology or neuroscience or whatever from your field Okay, la latest discoveries from your field that you consider to be the most important? <sighs> One area just in terms of usefulness um, is functional brain imaging. Mm -hmm. fMRI, you mean, right? Yep, yeah, exactly. The ability... <laughs> The ability to see what's going on in somebody's brain without having to take it out and slice it up and put it under a microscope and to do it under subtle, interesting circumstances. Um, amid that, there is a tremendous temptation to get too excited and carried away with what it can tell you. It has limited time resolution. It has limited spatial resolution. Um, you can only test this in people lying inside a very artificial machine. You can't see them. But that can tell us a whole lot. Um, that can tell us about correlations. Yeah. This tends to happen in the brain when you do X. Um, another extremely exciting domain is the ability to actually go in and manipulate something. And in that regard, one of the most exciting techniques is this transcranial magnetic stimulation, where you can go in and magnetically activate or inactivate temporarily certain parts of the cortex just underneath the skull. You mm -hmm. can't penetrate too deeply into the brain, so you can only look at cortical function. Mm -hmm. The effects last for very short periods, but there are now studies where you go in and you manipulate activity in some of these cortical regions, and you change how pro-socially people play an, eco an economic game. You change people's decisions about the moral correctness of behavior. You change how much money someone is willing to give in a hypothetical charitable situation. Um, that's no longer just showing correlation. That's actually showing that these are neural pathways that are actually mediating these behaviors. So those approaches are incredibly exciting. Um, at the other end, um, I say this while having exactly zero wisdom and knowledge about any of this. Um, but people are going to eventually understand the math of complex systems and chaotic systems mm -hmm. enough that it could be applied more readily to human brains and human behavior. I am like beyond terrible at math and I can't begin to have any hopes of understanding it. But at this very integrative holistic end, that's going to eventually be an area of tremendous excitement and advancement as well. Um, not coincidentally, if you can sit down somebody and you put probes on their head and you magnetically manipulate what a couple of hundred thousand neurons just underneath the skull are doing in terms of ionic flows and the person's moral values change for the next 45 seconds, mm -hmm. it's a pretty major attack on any old, like nice, like ancient notions we might have of free will. That sure, that sure weakens any arguments for it, as far as I'm concerned. And 
Plus, that's kind of like dangerous technology that opens up a whole bunch of possibilities for like manipulation of behavior, maybe. And... Um, possibly, although not a whole lot worse than sort of behavioral manipulation techniques have now. I don't know. There's there's this ridiculous, just asinine new field that's sort of beginning here um, that people are called neuromarketing. Yeah. How you study the brain in order to more effectively sell crap to people that they don't <laughs> need and do it at high. And oh, are people going to release like clouds of oxytocin into the air in department stores to make people want to buy more stuff? Um, Will it work? <laughs> no, quite possibly people will wind up having sex with people who they wouldn't otherwise have if they meet them in a department store. But it's probably not going to work in terms of selling them, well, selling them something else, but probably not the product. <laughs> Maybe just for sex shops, like. Yeah, okay, in that domain, it's going to be the greatest thing ever. Um, yeah, there, Marketing the advices from Robert Sapolsky, yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. This this is why I've been studying baboons all these years. I knew it would finally become useful for something. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. All these areas of science carry with them these dangers of manipulation. And we have no historical shortage of scientists or pseudoscientists or people who've been ready to grab and misinterpret and distort and lie about the findings of scientists to do awful things to humans. So yes, that danger, I think, gets ever bigger with brain science. Hmm. Uh, well, we all hope just that that will never happen, but who knows? Uh, yes. And just uh, one of the one of the questions that was just like we all are wondering, and it's not very scientific. It's again very personal. <laughs> when is your birthday? Because your Wikipedia page just tell, gives us the year, and it even doesn't. It, it, it says that you were born in 1957, and you are 59 or 60. Doesn't give the um, date. What's up with that? I have no idea. For a period, um, this friend of mine kept going on a Wiki, on my Wikipedia page and changing my middle name. <laughs> um, and then my son decided to start doing that also. So that was going on for a while. Um, the, at least the English language one has the correct date. I, I still don't know who put up the page. Um, it's April 6th. So I have about two more months until I turn 60. And I am not happy about that at all. I do <laughs> not be very mature about it when that happens. But that's, <laughs> that's sort of when my birthday is. Okay, thank you. Now we have this, some unique information and we can fix the, your Wikipedia page, probably. Uh, well, I guess we ru yeah, we ran out of time and it's just like great whole bunch of thank yous to you from us and everybody who's here and all of our subscribers. And uh, yeah, everybody just loves your lectures, actually. Thanks, and, thank you. Thank yeah. We, you. We really appreciate that. And just just one more little thing. Um, so we also have um, this thing where we make some t-shirts with the uh, scientists and some scientific uh, uh, like topics. And so as your lectures became so popular, we we've actually oh my we God. have one <laughs> we have one for you, and we can zoom in. Can can we zoom in? So I guess you, you you can you can see it, yeah. That that's you. That's uh, so it's that's hand. Wonderful. Yes, painted painted by hand, uh, oh. and like unique thing. But one problem we have, we don't, we couldn't come up with a quote. <laughs> yeah. So actually, you can see it. So that's you. Uh, and but we 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 need a quote to put down here. So maybe we couldn't come up with one. Maybe you have some idea what what quote can we put uh, under your portrait? What would you like uh, this oh. to be? Oh, the notion of that in Cyrillic there is is very exciting. Actually, looking at that, it occurs to me that if I lost some weight, I could actually look a lot like Rasputin, yeah. given that picture. Um, we, we mostly say it's like the first the first thing that people think that it's Hagrid from Harry Potter. <laughs> 
you, you, you do have some resemblance. I mean, and like all this, like animals and having a beard. Actually, my children have pointed that out. The, the big problem, though, is that I am uh, on the very short side. So <laughs> the, the similarity breaks down there. But yes, I would, I would much rather be mistaken for Hagrid than for Rasputin. <laughs> that's, that's very amusing. Actually, for a quote, I don't know. Yeah. How about we're a very confused species evolutionarily? Oh, that's, that's actually that's, that's good. That sums up. A lot of things of your work. Thank you very much. That actually that will be put here, and then we we, we will send this exact T-shirt because it's it's a ladies T-shirt. We'll send that to a girl who actually was translating. Uh, she's in Novosibirsk, one of our translators, Ksusha Dadonina. She's a doctor, and actually she's a neurologist, and she's not a professional translator, but she took up responsibility to, to start translating your lectures. And she's done, I think, like, we've done five, and she's done, like, three of them, which is, yeah, challenging, actually. But she's done a good job. So this one will go to her with your quote. And maybe you have something to say to our audience, to the, I don't know, whole Russia, to our 180,000 subscribers, or even more. Well, this is uh, <laughs> certainly a dizzying possibility. Um, what can I say? I, I certainly wish my father had lived to see the bizarrity of this moment, uh, the possibility of a T-shirt with my face on it in Russian. Um, thank you for watching these. Thank you for being interested in science. Um, I hope a greater percentage of people in Russia are interested in science than the percentage in the United States are. Um, I think there would be a whole lot We are lot working more. on it. We are working on it. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you guys are. We're, we're not doing a very good job of it at, at this end of the planet. Um, I don't know. Good luck to everyone. Think scientifically. Think very cautiously before you do something. Um, remember, we're a complicated, confused species, um, and we're a very vulnerable, fragile one. Um, yeah. Thank you for translating the lectures. That's That's been very exciting for me to think about sort of these being sent around Russia. It's very pleasing. <laughs> <laughs>